Roger and I are standing in front of the building uh, which replaced that which originally housed the old North Station and the old Boston Garden. It's on Causeway Street in Boston. Hmm. I wonder why it's named Causeway. It certainly doesn't look like one. Behind me is Canal Street which runs all the way down to Haymarket Square. A haymarket. Now there's an evocative name. It takes one back to early Boston with its horses and wagons, doesn't it? Should we think of it as a filling station? And Canal Street, where did it get that name? Was there really a canal here? I've learned that the answer to that question is yes indeed. There was a sea level canal that ran beside Canal Street to Haymarket. There was an extension that carried the canal all the way to the waterfront a few yards beyond Quincy Market. The startling fact is that this canal, which ran from the Charles River to the harbor, bisected Boston. To go to the north end, or vice versa, meant crossing a bridge, and several of these were drawbridges. One of these was located right where I'm standing, and another one at Traverse Street. Canal Street was originally a towpath for horses. When was this, you may ask? That question is easy to answer. The canal was built in 1810, and it operated successfully for almost 30 years. How did it come about? Answering that question requires us to revisit some of the significant events in the early history of Boston. When the English established the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1630, they chose the Shawmont Peninsula for their first settlement and renamed it Boston. It was a fine choice commanding one of the finest harbors in the Atlantic seaboard, protected by offshore islands, deep enough for any ship, and offering a waterfront with ample space for docks. The settlement of Boston prospered and became known worldwide for its shipping prowess. Many a mansion was built by wealthy merchants and successful ship owners. Commerce with other British colonies was minimal. In fact, it was actively discouraged by the Crown. Boston was spoken of as a tight little island, despite being attached to Roxbury by a narrow neck of land. Victory in the war for American independence might be celebrated throughout the colonies, but for Boston, it was an economic disaster. Go on was the comfortable trade with the mother country. And it would take years to develop comparable trade with other states and with other countries. Moreover, American shipping was being harassed by British warships who took the opportunity to, shall we say, liberate sailors who might be British and who had no American documentation. Likewise gone was the inherent protection provided by British troops and British arms. The Federalist Party, led by Alexander Hamilton, immediately began pressing for two related objectives. One, provide close connections among the states. And two, greatly improve access to the interior. These urgent objectives came at a time when railroads were non-existent. 
and when roads were notoriously poor, often little more than dirt tracks through the wilderness. Boston found itself at a disadvantage relative to other Atlantic ports. For example, New York had the Hudson River, Philadelphia the Delaware, Baltimore the Susquehanna. Boston had but the Charles River, navigable only as far as Watertown, and the Mystic River, navigable only as far as Medford. The only sizable river near Boston was the Merrimack, coming down out of New Hampshire. However, as it reaches the Massachusetts line, it turns east, emptying into the ocean at Newburyport. It's 25 miles north of Boston at its nearest point. In Europe, the same need had been met with networks of canals, and the technology had become quite advanced. As you can imagine, in Boston, many canal proposals were floated, most of them totally unreasonable. One scheme, however, caught the attention of an enterprising lawyer, James Sullivan, who was later to become the governor of the Commonwealth, and for whom Sullivan Square is named. Its objective was to construct a continuous waterway from Boston to Concord, New Hampshire, thereby opening up the, quote, North Country with its rich resources. The specific concept was to construct the towpath canal through Middlesex County, thereby connecting the Mystic River at Medford with the Merrimack River at just above the formidable Pawtucket Falls at present day Lowell. The southern terminus was subsequently changed to the Charles River at Charlestown. Now from its northern terminus, the waterway would continue up the Merrimack to Concord. Some effort had already gone into overcoming the main obstacles along the river, but further improvement would be necessary. Now from the southern terminus in Charlestown, boats could be drawn across the Charles to the Boston Peninsula. Sullivan recruited a group of proprietors. He drafted an act and shepherded it through the Massachusetts General Court in early 1793. The act, with its attendant constraints and privileges, authorized a private venture. The canal was to be completed in 10 years. He proceeded to form the Middlesex Canal Company to implement it and served as its president for the rest of his life. The supervision of construction was entrusted to Colonel Loemi Baldwin of Woburn. He had served under George Washington and afterwards emerged as the unschooled but creative builder of many public works. It happens that the Baldwin family farm bordered on the route chosen for the canal. Subsequently, the Baldwin mansion was moved across the canal to its present site on the longest fully watered segment of the canal. Under his direction, the Middlesex Canal was completed on schedule in 1803 and began operation the next year. It was a marvel of its day, dug by hand for 27 miles, with 20 locks, eight aqueducts, and numerous culverts, bridges, and landings. As the first long hand-dug canal in America, the Middlesex Canal served as a model for those to follow, including the Erie Canal. It offers an absorbing story of groundbreaking initiative. I'm 
standing on the edge of the Concord River in North Billerick at this time. This is the dam which formed the mill pond here, which served as the source of water for the canal in both directions. On my right is the dam that was built to form the original mill pond. It was raised and strengthened by the Middlesex Canal Company to increase the water needed for the canal. Also on my right are the remains of a lock needed to adjust for varying levels in the river. What's still visible is the seat for the upper wooden gate. Like all the locks of the canal, it incorporates mitered gates invented by that genius Leonardo da Vinci around 1550. Canal boats had to cross this pond from the point of land over there, which created a problem, how to tow them across. This was solved by Baldwin's ingenious idea, a floating towpath. The near end of it was tethered to an iron ring in a large rock off to my right. You can see it for yourself if you walk down to the shore. Uh, behind me is one of two brick mills, both of which were serviced by this dam. This is the Faulkner Mill. And if you look carefully, you will see that sign. It indicates that it is the location of the Middlesex Canals Association Visitors Center and Museum. The route of the Middlesex Canal crossed various waterways, three of which were rivers. At this point, the Shawsheen River down below was 30 feet below the level of the canal, and so an aqueduct was required. And this was built at that time. You can see that here have two abutments and a central pier. And uh, the, between those, there would be a trough of timbers very carefully uh, fitted together so as to make a tight uh, channel. And on the far side, there would be also a towpath. This structure was noted as a very unusual structure in its day, so much so that the American Society of Civil Engineers in 1967 dedicated a plaque on the front of this central pier. At Charlestown, the canal entered a tidal mill pond formed by walling off a bay of the Charles River estuary, which had been constructed in the years 1670 to 75 to furnish power for mills to grind corn and saw lumber. Building the wall for the mill dam was no mean feat. Its overall length was over half a mile, and its height great enough to extend above high tide. It must have been a communal effort, since there appear to have been only about 200 able-bodied men in Charlestown at the time. The wall was probably constructed by laying rocks and adding fill out from the shore, perhaps on a footing of timber. However it was done, the wall lasted 150 years with only occasional repairs. Interrupting this wall was a platform of mills, plus a gate permitting the pond to be filled at high tide and held at that level. The water could then be directed onto the mill wheels when the tide was out. Boats could enter or leave by the gate at flood tide. The mill might operate several hours out of the 12-hour tide cycle each day. Unfortunately, there are no explicit records to support this scenario, only various clues. Later, the gate was supplanted by a lock to permit boats to pass at other times. With foresight, the Middlesex Canal Company purchased the entire mill pond complex and set about improving all of its features. For example, to cross the pond, a floating towpath had been introduced between the canal entry and the existing lock. 
This was replaced by a permanent embankment. The lock itself was improved, the mills were renovated and access improved, the dam was reinforced where needed. From the mill pond, Boston destinations could be reached by either of two options. One, by loading cargo onto wagons and hauling them across Charlestown to the bridge to Boston, which had opened in 1786. Colonel Baldwin had been active in its design and construction, incidentally. Alternatively, canal boats could be pulled across the Charles River to a wharf and warehouse rented on the northern tip of the Shawmut Peninsula. From here, it was about a mile to the center of Boston on a rough road. Crossing the Charles River was not a trivial matter. Canal boats, long and narrow, were designed to be towed, not navigated in open water with current, wind, and a curving route. Rather, they must be hauled hand by hand along a cable called a warp. However, such a cable must not interfere with traffic on the river itself. Colonel Bowen's solutions was ingenious. He placed buoys along the route tethered to anchors below. A heavy iron ring was slipped over each tether. The cable was attached to each ring in turn. With this arrangement, the cable would rise as it was being pulled, bringing the ring with it. After passing a buoy, the ring would pull the cable to the bottom again, out of the way of passing boats. The canal company had a standing offer to supply a pilot, so-called, for each passage at the price of one dollar. Presumably, the pilot did not actually pull the boat, but he was responsible for controlling the warp, adjusting for current, tidal flow, and wind, and assuring that the boat never went adrift. Either of the above options had the serious disadvantage of requiring cargo to be loaded on wagons and hauled to their final destination in Boston. Fortunately, a third option appeared a few years later. This option is the special feature of this account. Once again, an historical review is in order. First, some topography. Let us examine a map of Boston as it appeared in 1640. Beside the north end lies the North Cove. In this cove is shown a swampy island which extends almost across the opening. A trail ran through it, apparently used by the Indians. As early as 1630, a settler named Crabtree observed that this island could be extended on both ends to form a tidal mill pond such as the one previously described, and he set about doing it. However, as you can imagine, it was far too much for an individual, and he had to give up. Thirteen years later, the project was taken up by Henry Simons and five associates. They secured the grant of this cove from the town on the condition that they construct a mill pond and erect one or more mills. They were to provide a floodgate 10 feet wide for the passage of boats and had a right to cut a channel through the marshy portion of the pond to a creek leading southeast to the town cove, providing they erected passable ways for crossing by horse and cart. The group proceeded to complete the dam and to dig out what became known as Mill Creek, leading to the waterfronts. They erected three mills, one at the western end of the dam, one at the northeast end, and one at the junction of the mill pond with the creek. Mill operations continued for almost 150 years, during which there were various changes in the mills. The mills at the western end of the dam, which had its own floodgate, 
was the first to seize operation. The mill at the northeast of the dam burned about the time of the revolution and was replaced by three others. Two mills were located near the entrance to Mill Creek, also later replaced. Over time, the mill pond began to become polluted. When the western mill closed, its gate remained closed. And that corner of the pond began to develop a stench due to debris that was carelessly dumped in, including dead animals and local privy runoff. Likewise, other parts of the pond became filthy, bringing complaints from neighboring settlers. This unhealthy condition joined with another factor to force a significant change to this segment of the route in the early 1800s. With the steady growth of Boston, land was becoming scarce. On all sides, land making was in progress. The mill pond inevitably became a target, both because of its central location and because of its stench which in those days was presumed to breed disease. Resistance came from those who felt that the mills were an asset, as well as those who thought open bodies of water should be preserved as a source of cooling breezes. In 1804, a town committee was appointed to investigate the possibility and desirability of filling the mill pond. Before the committee was ready to report, the mill owners, who were the successors of the pond's original proprietors, obtained an act of the legislature incorporating them as the Boston Mill Corporation, BMC, with a clear intention of filling the pond. Spirited discussion at meetings and articles in the press followed debating the desirability of filling and the constraints that should apply. A fresh element that entered into consideration was the completion in 1803 of the Middlesex Canal. It, be it became evident to some that a canal through Boston would constitute a logical extension, providing direct access to the waterfront and to businesses along the way. Finally, in 1807, an agreement was reached between the town and the BMC on filling the pond, subject to various restrictions, such as requiring the BMC to pay the cost of filling, reserving some land for town use, providing proper sewer streets, and so on. One special provision was that Mill Creek would be kept open and extended through the filled pond. Yeah. According to Nancy Seashoals, an archaeologist who specializes in the topographical history of Boston, this latter position was directly attributable to the recent completion of the Middlesex Canal and the desire to extend its benefits all the way to the Boston waterfront and in intermediate locations notably Haymarket Square. A street plan was laid out by Charles Bullfinch, then a member of the Selectmen, to accommodate the canal. A sketch shows schematically his concept superimposed on the boundaries of the pond. The plan is basically a triangle with a canal at its center its base on Causeway Street, and its apex at Haymarket Square. Note that the Mill Creek continues through to the waterfront, thereby completing the bisection of Boston. Completion of the project, including filling the entire area and adding bridges and so on, took almost 21 years. That is a story in itself. However, the canal was a priority, and the first contract for its construction was let in 1809. Other contracts followed. 
The walls were built freestanding across the mill pond, 40 feet apart over most of the 1,000-foot lengths, narrower at Causeway Street. The width was later increased in places to 60 feet. As to the structure of the canal walls, my information comes from Dr. C. Scholl's dissertation at Boston University, dealing with land making in Boston. Typically, such walls were built of stone on a footing of timbers. The footing consisted of, quote, grillages, that is, latticed rafts of pine pinned together with oak tree nails, or trunnels, as they were called. These were floated into position and were set into the bottom except where the base was sufficiently firm to support the wall. On top was a, quote, battered wall of rock laced with horizontal and vertical timbers. Presumably, the grillages, never being exposed to the air, last indefinitely and prevent individual rocks from sinking into the mud. In turn, the weight of the rocks holds them in place. The level of water in the canal was a matter of concern. It would be convenient for users if the water were constantly held at a few feet below the top of the walls. However, this would require a guard lock at each end to adjust for the variation of tide level. However, a source of water at the highest level is required to replenish the water released during each locking operation. No such source existed in mid-Boston. The result is clear. The canal must operate at sea level. In short, the water level is governed by the rise and fall of the tide, and the walls must be high enough to contain high tide. Now, the contract for the walls called for them to be eight feet high. Considering that the average range of height of tide is nine feet in Boston Harbor, and often more, it is evident that the boats will be stranded at low tide. However, they can be moved half of the time or more, which is not unreasonable, since the process of loading takes time and boats can be left for another cycle. At its eastern end, this canal was joined to Mill Creek, already deepened and improved. Together, these two segments provided a waterway from the Charles River to the Boston waterfront. In so doing, they actually bisected Boston during their active years, about 30 in all. Crossing the canal required bridges a half a dozen or so. There were three drawbridges. The others were permanent or makeshift. The completion of the canal through Boston brought immediate benefits to Boston merchants, as predicted. It also lifted the spirits of the investors in the Middlesex Canal as traffic multiplied and revenues increased. In 1819, the canal paid dividends for the first time, and it continued this way for almost 20 years. Unfortunately, this revenue never fully recovered the costs of construction, maintenance, and operation. Traffic on Mill Creek was never great. Besides being constrained by tide level, it reached the harbor at a single location, from which most of its cargo must be transported to other wharves. Finally, increasingly business was principally transacted near Haymarket. As the creek became polluted and fell into disuse, they came pressure to fill it and use its land for other purposes. When Femmel Market, later renamed Quincy Market, was begun in 1824 under Mayor Josiah Quincy, it was necessary to relocate the end of Mill 
Creek to another wharf. A few years later, the entire creek was filled in. Incidentally, the granite for the market was transported down the Middlesex Canal and through Mill Creek. The main portion of the Boston Canal ceased operation not long after, losing its traffic to that nemesis of all canals, the railroad. In 1845, the Boston and Maine Railroad, having bridged the Charles River and acquired the right of way, built a handsome depot at Haymarket Square, filled the canal, and laid track in its place, thus bringing our saga to an end. Here we are again on Causeway Street, and I find myself imagining what did this area look like at the time the canal opened? That would be about 190 years ago. Everything in front of me would disappear to be replaced by the tidewater of the Charles River estuary lapping at my feet at the outer edge of Causeway. Behind me, a wide embankment to be known as Canal Street would stretch to Haymarket Square beside it on a second embankment uh, to contain the sea level canal. A gravel road would top the embankments, each one busy with horse-drawn wagons unloading the canal boats and carrying goods to their ultimate locations in Boston. On both sides would be the remaining portions of the old mill pond, which would eventually dry up and be filled in to create valuable real estate. The Mill Creek extension leading down to the harbor might be hidden from our view. The spot where I'm standing would be occupied with one end of a drawbridge. A second drawbridge would be under construction at Traverse Street to connect the street across the muddy flats. A third drawbridge would be added near Haymarket. By the middle of the 19th century, the canal was gone, to the satisfaction of those who viewed it as an ugly gash, smelling of ocean mud, and constantly delaying traffic at the bridges that stitched Boston together. Nonetheless, together with a few bridges across the Charles River, the canal had broken the image of Boston as a tight little island and it played an instrumental role in building the thriving community you see before you. Furthermore, in enabling a continuous waterway from Boston to central New Hampshire, it established a corridor that fostered healthy development all along its route, a corridor that pulsates today. What can one find here? gone is the mill pond and the canal that crossed it. The only trace of that period consists of street names, Causeway, the boundary of the mill pond, Canal, the towpath. Happily, plans are afoot to establish a small park on a corner by Haymarket to keep alive the memory of this historic extension of the Middlesex Canal which once bisected the very heart of Boston.